Excuse me for sounding like a high school English teacher here, but I think that ink is magical. It's a bridge between the world of flesh and blood and the world of thoughts and dreams. I know I often can't think through an idea unless I'm physically writing or sketching it out, and I know a lot of people are the same. It's like my hands physically move me through my thoughts and the ink just records the trace of those thoughts. The words written down are nothing more than a sketchy bit of evidence of the actual expansive and sprawling thoughts and feelings in my head. History is by definition the study of the past through written documents. And incidentally, a lot of people find history super boring. For me, history becomes interesting when you start to look beyond those inky traces and try to imagine how the world might have felt like or sounded or smelled like for a person in that time, sitting there, writing those boring documents. So today I'm setting out to learn how to make a writing ink of my own, like they would have had in the 1700s, something of a golden age for boring documents. But I'm going to use some locally forged ingredients for mine because I want to. The type of ink I want to make is called Iron Gall ink. It was the standard ink in Europe from the 12th to 19th centuries, and its main ingredients are gall nuts, iron salts, and acacia gum. The recipe I'm using is from a 1795 text titled 1000 Valuable Secrets in the Elegant and Useful Arts. I could have used just about any old recipe book going back about 800 years, but this one has an entire chapter of ink recipes, and the very first one is for an iron gall ink. And so is this one. And this one. And there are so many different iron gall ink recipes in this book that you really have to question whether they were all actually in use or if the author just copied every single recipe that he could find in order to sell books. But this one stood out to me because of its relative simplicity. It's just water, gall nuts, iron salts, and acacia gum with no other additions. So I chose to use this as my guide, though I might do a little improvising because I just, I will. I'm bad at recipes. But before I begin making this iron gall ink, there's something I should address. A gall is a baby insect nursery made from the living tissues of a plant. Many species of insects and arachnids lay their eggs inside many different species of plants. They do this to shield them from the elements, to protect them from predators, and to give their larvae an immediate source of food when they hatch. When the plants detect that there's something laying eggs under their skin, they have a reaction. Just like you and me. <laughs> This reaction is to create weird growth patterns in the affected tissue, and these growth patterns take the shape of a perfectly ordered cute little baby bug home. I've always seen this described as the insect tricking the plant by hacking its innate defense systems, but plants aren't people, and neither are trees, and it might actually be beneficial for a plant to contribute to the development of a new generation of pollinators. So if you're gonna anthropomorphize it, I don't see why it can't be a loving relationship of care. Gall nuts are a specific type of gall from a specific type of oak made from specific certain types of wasps and these are particularly special. The chemical signals from the gall wasps trigger the oak into creating these nice globe-shaped galls that are not only structurally protective, they're also chemically protective. The galls are extremely high in astringent compounds called tannins. Supposedly, this is because the oak is sending the tannins to this infected part of the tissues to ward off the infection. But what that means for the larva is that no predator is gonna wanna bite into your home because it tastes bitter and like potentially toxic. And for an old timey scribe, what that means is you can go to an oak tree and pick a perfectly round gall nut and be fairly certain that it will be extremely high in tannins, which you can then extract and make Ink. In 1795, the year that my recipe is from, you probably would have just been able to go down to this door and buy yourself a big old bag of round European oak gall nuts. That's not what I have. What I have are these much more uneven lumpy guys and I got them from a local park from an oak tree there that had a whole bunch of galls all over it. Pretty much any odd growth on a plant is a gall. These ones though, you can be sure that they are galls because they are riddled with exit holes. The gall nuts that are in recipes, they have just one exit hole because just one tiny little wasp guy lives inside of them. 
all oaks do have a lot of tannin in them and I'm hoping that these galls will also have a higher concentration of tannin than the rest of the plant, just like our, our gall nut friends, but uh, we'll see. First step is to bruise three ounces of gall nuts on a stone. I tried my darndest to bruise these guys, but I think they just have a different constitution than the galls specified. They're really hard. Next, put the galls in 30 ounces of warm rainwater. I collected some rainwater, but then I moved across the country. So instead, I used demineralized water. I heated the water in an aluminum pot instead of a steel one. Rainwater is specified in the recipe because it is free of contaminants that could spoil the ink, especially iron, which will react with the tannins in the galls. So our recipe says to let this sit in the sun for two days. However, I think that just means keep it sort of warm for two days. And since it's minus 25 outside, the window's not really the warmest place in my house. So to the radiator in the bathroom, it'll go. Okay, so here it is about 20 hours or a day later. It is darker than I would expect it to be, which might be a bit of a problem. It seems like something other than just the tannins is escaping into the water. Definitely something is happening. So the recipe says to add in the vitriol tomorrow, but I think we're going to do this a bit differently. Maybe wait an extra day, depending on how it looks. And then also, instead of just adding the vitriol directly into here, I think I'm going to strain it first, because otherwise the iron is just going to react, I think, with our lumps rather than with our solution. I guess I better get my other supplies ready, though, because it is doing stuff. After this steeps for another day, the next step is to add green vitriol, a much cooler name for something that we now call ferrous sulfate. It's an iron salt that shows up in a lot of old household recipes. In the past, I've substituted green vitriol with a quick and dirty solution of scrap steel and white vinegar, and that's what I was going to do here. However, after reading a lot of stuff on the internet about solubility and oxidization and blah 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 blah, I learned Nothing really, but I was humbled enough by my lack of understanding that I decided to just bite the bullet and order some proper ferrous sulfate online. This was going to take a few days to show up, so in the meantime my galls were getting a bit overdone, and this was something I had to deal with because they smelled really bad. I decided to strain the whole thing and stick the juices in the fridge so they'd stop doing whatever they were doing to smell so bad. I was expecting like an earthy smell or maybe something a bit tangy even, but this smell required hermetic sealing. It smells like stale urine mixed with crayons. Stuff acquired. Let's make some ink. I transferred my gall liquid to a container with a wide mouth and with pouring capabilities. Here I should mention that everything I'm using is from my designated science kit and not things I use for food. The next step is to add the finest green vitriol. I dissolved my green vitriol in warm water first, which looking back was a big old mistake because it really screwed up the ratios, but anyway. When this gets added to the gall water, it will commence the reaction central to every iron gall ink recipe. The soluble iron reacts with the tannins to form ferrous tannate. Okay, definitely don't need all of that. That just went right away. Finally, the hole needed to be thickened with either gum arabic or cherry tree gum. Gum arabic is more available. It's also called gum acacia, Senegal gum, and Sudanese gum. It's made from a sap harvested from acacia trees and has been used as a binder and thickening agent for millennia. From a bit of research, it seems like the name gum arabic in English is a holdover from its introduction to Europe hundreds of years ago via Arab traders, but I'm not really certain about that. Again, I mixed this with hot water to dissolve it instead of just pouring it in like the recipe said, which was also an oopsie because ratios. 
When the gum was ready, I did all my stirring and mixing and bottling in the sink because I'm a mess. The recipe said once all was mixed to boil it one bubble. I assumed this was a sterilization measure and it was still heinously stinking and I didn't want to infuse my house with that smell. So instead I borrowed from another recipe in the book that suggests using cloves to prevent molting. I popped a couple whole cloves into each bottle. And if you're thinking, gee, that's looking a bit watery there, bud, well, you'd be right. I kind of bungled everything up by adding extra water to the recipe. I could try to salvage it by heading outdoors with a hot plate to boil off some of the liquid. But my mystery galls performed well and my curiosity has been satisfied, so I think I'll just call it a day and enjoy my slightly too watery ink. Thank you genuinely for watching, especially after my months long hiatus. It's really good to be back and I'll see you again in a week, a month, who knows, not me.